Well, hello there, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Rocking Remote Work, how to build a healthy and high-performing culture in today's environment. My name is Joe McClinsky. I will be today's, today your host. I'm also the CEO of Shift. And if you're joining us as one of our clients or one of our long-staying relationships, I wanna say welcome back. We are really committed in this time, in this moment, to help be of service and support to you. And it has been a whirlwind three weeks, ladies and gentlemen. It is April 2nd, and we have now just helped migrate more than 20,000 employees within our customer base to this new world order. It appears as if we're going to be doing this for quite some time, and we're gonna talk a lot about that here today. But if you're joining us and you're not currently a Shift customer, we welcome you too. We wanna to also say thank you so much for taking your careers and your jobs, and in this moment, your lives a bit more seriously. For today, uh, we are super excited about this conversation about remote work and the future of work because in a sense, we feel like we've had a bit of a head start on this conversation. The reason that we've been so, I think, helpful for our clients over the last couple of weeks and helping them make this transition is not only you know, do we have a podcast about the future of work, have we been given conversations and presentations on the future of work, but really 19 years ago when I started this company, uh, I was a bit of a, of a misfit. I had not had a, uh, a you know, a time in an organization. I had not worked in corporate America. And as I had started up the first few businesses I had, I had the opportunity not to live in a cubicle, not to live in this construct that we look at now as work, the, the notions of working nine to five and Monday through Friday and long commutes and, and this top-down hierarchy that almost every organization still has, we just decided to challenge everything. And in the name of high performance, in the name of reaching your potential, in the, in the name of being the most innovative company that you possibly could be. So if you are representing your organization today as an executive, as a business leader, again, kudos to you for being here today and trying to, to learn what are the, the real good maps and methods for transitioning your team. If you're someone inside of an organization, yet maybe not with the influence of a manager or a leader title yet, that's okay too, because today's workshop is really gonna be meant for all folks who are sitting in this new world order of work. And for us, one of the things I think I wanted to start with was, you know, as I just got done telling you a little bit about why we started the organization, I'm gonna sort of unpack it one more click deeper, which is, you know, when we really thought about the purpose of the organization, like what does it all add up to? Meaning, you know, sure, it's great to see organizations build high performing teams. It's amazing to see organizations grow regardless. We love helping our clients with innovation and helping them find an edge on their competition. But when you bubble that all up, when you follow the bouncing ball, so to speak, where does it go? And for us, it was one of these things where, you know, we watched all of the trends in work over the last, you know, 20 years where, you know, people are disengaged. We know that Gallup publishes their famous engagement survey every year, and it says basically the same thing. We, we, we have about a, you know, 70% disengagement rate, meaning, you know, a lot of folks wake up on Monday with the Monday blues, or they had the Sunday scaries, or, you know, they're just not looking forward to work. And, and this takes a toll, it does. I mean, imagine if you went to the gym every single day, but instead of working out, you, you, you ate Doritos and, and drank Mountain Dew. I mean, think about what that would do to your physiology, what it would do to your psychology, what it would do to your overall philosophy of life. I mean, how do you come home and be your best for your, for your, for your kids? How do you be your best for your spouse, your significant other, your partner? How do you be your best for yourself? And frankly, as a, a, as a concerned citizen. And so, that really is the long arc of where we're coming from. We believe that the single greatest lever of human potential is a more engaged workforce. So let's get to it. As we think about the way things are changing, as we've been talking about, you know, a lot of these changes have been taking place over the last few decades. Now, if you go all the way back to the way work started, it was this notion of separating the, the knowers and the doers. It was looking at people you know, putting you know, on the assembly line when we were doing these mass production facilities, we had this separation, again, between knowers and doers. And back then, there was this arrangement made with every organization. They called it the, the Ford Pack, right? That we will take care of you. We will, you know, as the employer, we will work with you. 
And, and that seemed like the right thing for that time. But what we know is, you know, these fixed agreements, the, the, the notion that you might stay at a company for decades, the notion that a company might stay around for decades is really no longer true. I mean, how we work today is, is getting more diverse and not just from a, a gig perspective, meaning that there's about 40 to 50% of the current population in the gig status, there probably will be much more as we continue to traverse COVID-19's impact, but also you know, just millennials in and of themselves will have upwards of 10 plus jobs by the time they're 45. So it's time to update the software, but if you wanted to kind of have a little bit of a sneak peek on why we believe this is true, it's because we've been following Moore's law, this rapid pace of change, this rapid exponential growth. In fact, it's one of the reasons I think people have had such a hard time with COVID-19 is because most human brains, they think in a local and linear fashion. We are very good with sequence, step one, step two, step three. But what we've learned with Moore's law that's sitting in front of you is that, you know, we have been following from a technology standpoint, this idea of doubling, going from two to four to eight to 16. And before you know it, those numbers add up to things that we're just not used to associating our brains with. In fact, in a lot of respects, it's been why we've had such a hard time seeing COVID-19's impact because it's not linear, it's exponential. Well, that same exponential impact is happening in the workplace because we've now gone from a few generations to the work, workforce only a couple decades ago to now having five generations in the workforce, which means we now have a lot of commingling of values. We have a lot of priorities that are different. People have different work styles. And as we've been commingling, one of the dynamics we've seen is a, this recent growth in remote work. In fact, in the last five years, it's grown by 44%. You know, in the last 10 years, it's grown 91%. In the last 12 years, there's that doubling, this 159%. We also, get a chance to gnaw away at the distributed work model, like where we work. I know for me, I used to have to go to Washington, DC. I live in Baltimore. Um, a few of our clients used to be down there. And I remember sitting in the commute all the time, like, you know, we're losing upwards of two hours each way, just going from where you start the day to where you end the day. And as you start to look at kind of the way that people think about remote work, you can see most industries within this graph are in the single digits. Again, this was all pre-COVID-19, you know, with less than 5% of the US employee population being able to remote or to, to work remote rather, um, at least half the week. And since COVID-19, just to give you a before and an after, there have been some struggles and benefits of working remote according to some of the people who do it regularly. So, you know, some of the biggest struggles are communication and collaboration, not being able to unplug you know, I was uh, doing a workshop recently and my kids uh, came through, Ellie and James, and they may do it again today. You know, this notion of trying to figure out like how do we really do what we did at the office, but maybe do it at the house. And, and for those who are trying to copy and paste those, those methods and maps, what we'll talk about here today, I think is gonna be really, really helpful. And I'm really excited because we're dusting off something that we have not really taught or trained in quite some time. And I think it's one of the single greatest um, important activities that anyone can do, whether COVID-19 was here or not on a weekly basis. Again, a little cliffhanger there for you. But again, some of the biggest benefits. I mean, how many people are enjoying a, a little bit of time to be able to exercise when they want or take a walk when they want or just getting back that commute time? So again, it's not all good, it's not all bad, but it's definitely something for us to harmonize as we continue to make these strides. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a step back as well and pay some homage to some amazing thinkers like you know, Dan Pink and Adam Grant, but specifically Dan Pink. He's written several books about work. And one of my favorites was a book called Drive. And in there, he talked about what were the reasons that people worked? You know, was it about compensation? Was it about the benefits, the perks? You know, was it about their career path? And what he found was, is that it really was about three things. It was about um, mastery. It was about um, purpose, right? This idea of doing something bigger than yourselves. Mastery being this, this, this concept of how do I continue to get better at what I do? I love the concept of, you know, uh, earners are learners, right? And so in this 
this, this new world order we have at COVID-19. Hopefully you've had a chance to really dust off whether it's you know, modules on Udemy or Coursera or LinkedIn Learning, but, but truly this is a chance to sharpen your saw. But he also highlighted a bigger point about autonomy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about autonomy, agency, and trust. But why we work is changing, I think is really important because people are no longer doing this for just the money. We can see the values of the millennials are thinking very differently in the sharing economy. They're not looking for the big mortgages. They're not looking for the big bills. And they're starting to blend these values into the workplace. So again, we could decide to not embrace, we could decide to fight or avoid, but I think there's a bigger way to get out of you know, this double bind, if you will, this rock or hard place. Is it their way or our way? Now, we also know their way, our way, no matter what way, that workplace, the experience itself is highly stressful. About 83% of the workforce experiences stress on a regular basis. This again was pre-COVID-19. So if you take a step back and you think about stress, you know, there are lots of different, um, certainly opinions about stress. But one of the things that we like to do here at Shift is look at the science. If you want a great book that talks about the science of stress, there's a book called um, why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. He's a really amazing neuroscientist who came up with you know, a, a lot of really good findings about what does cortisol do to our body? How does it change our decision-making? And here's the long and short of the book. Most of us think we're really good under pressure, and we might be, but we're also not able to see the forest through the trees. We get what's called tunnel vision. The blood basically in the neocortex leaves and goes to the fight or flight center where it's really kept you healthy. It's kept you alive. It's a central nervous system that's hundreds of thousands of years old. But now we're in an environment where we're not exactly sure, is the bear chasing us? And we're gonna talk a little bit about this here today. When we work, nine to five, Monday through Friday, I think again, this is an opportunity if you're an executive or an entrepreneur listening to this. One of the things that we've done at Shift uh, for quite some time, and look, I will humble brag all day long because over the last 10 years, we've been recognized eight times, three times nationally as a best place to work because we really allow this work, uh, this results only work environment where, you know, yes, there are some meetings that have to happen during the day. And yes, we'd like to have boundaries on Saturdays, but you know, the idea that people are just adults, like let them work to get the work done. And the more agency, which we're going to talk about here in a second, and autonomy that you give people, what you tend to find is this will produce a high performing environment. Now, again, it does not come without a tax, without a toll. You know, people still are having some hard times at work. And I wanted to highlight a couple other quick stats here. You know, everything from 75% of the workforce says their bosses are the most stressful part of their job. So again, you know, when you think about a boss today, even the word boss, it's like a, a monitor. It's, it's like a police state, this, this idea of I've got to come get permission. And when you think about getting permission as a grown adult, it's kind of an interesting thing. And go all the way down to the bottom here, it's 48% have actually cried at work. Not a bad thing, by the way. But is this really the kind of environment that we want to produce the best results? I don't think so. And just the idea also, of how do we redefine the way that we capture and create value? Is it just based on time? We see a world where there are technologies coming out with blockchain that you might be able to create these digital tokens that will follow you around forever, that help people see what's the value that you've given back. And you know, there's been some really, really interesting adjustments to, again, how people are job sharing, how we're creating different marketplaces for folks. And we're really excited to not only help play a part with the innovators making this happen as we would like to say we're one of those innovators, but also helping the early adopters get there even faster. So the state of the state, we all know what's going on with COVID-19. You're probably watching the news way too much at this point, but remember, you know, the COVID-19 is not just about the virus of the body, it's about the virus of the mind. And so you're joining today's training workshop, hopefully with the idea in mind of being able to sort of depart and separate yourself from a bit of that fear and panic. You know, in this moment, it's really about taking this moment and creating a movement, a movement of change and not being panicked, but having a plan, you know, finding some sense of ground and beauty. And again, we're gonna talk about this a little bit here today, but look, the impact is unquestionable. 
you know, we're seeing industries really, really hit hard. We know that this is going to have a ripple effect throughout the entire business landscape. You know, no matter how fast and quickly we recover at this point, there is no going back to tomorrow. There is no normal from yesterday that we will ever see again today. When you've you know, had this type of experience before, if you go all the way back to, you know, if you remember you know, where you were during 9-11 or where you were during 2008, the Great Recession, you know, I remember as we were first entering those early phases, you know, there was that, again, very humanistic mo notion to go back to the way it was. And what you'll start to see, again, here, I think as it, things continue to unfold, is that we need to start thinking beyond, you know, around the corner, but really beyond exponential thinking. Because, you know, the technologies that are around today, the way in which we might get things done, the, the just the creative genius, there are more than... 200,000 scientists today working on together the first time in the history of mankind against this common enemy COVID-19. Imagine what pops out of this from an innovation perspective on how we should think about work. Now, look, it's no, it's no mistake that pre-COVID-19, the work world was fraught with issues. We've talked about some of these, you know, everything from not knowing what your priorities are to being disengaged to having sort of an environment of trust. And some of our data that we do, we collect data, we do surveys on organizations all the time. We believe in this evidence-based approach. And what you'll see here is a smattering of data that again sort of says, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. In fact, you know, I love one of these stats here about, you know, 30% are passionate about their work. You know, we have this frame that we use that work should be consistent with, you know, your biology, your head, your heart and gut. It was a thesis that we wrote in our last book, Shift the Work. And if you've not checked that out, please give it a whirl. So ready or not, the future of work is here. And again, we've talked about this. We've been built for this moment because we had a head start running into this turn. It's, I saw this yesterday on Facebook. I thought it was really interesting. It's like, you know, when you think about going into a recession or a depression or a big change in the business environment, it's almost like uh, 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 driving a race car. And I've had the experience of doing that once. It's like when you come into a turn, you know, really good drivers actually break first so they can get efficient and then speed through the turn right at the right apex moment. And I think most of us in business have woken up to COVID-19. We've woken up to that this is a thing. But we know that some organizations are still trying to clean up and, and create some more buoyancy. And so again, you know, if today's conversation sparks the need or the interest to have a conversation, we are here right now to be of service and support. We're going to continue to, you know, on a monthly basis, not only hold these types of workshops and webinars, but if you have interest in having us do this for your organization, or if you just have a question, all you have to do is email us. So when you think about evolution, you know, one of the things I love about evolution is, uh, you know, this, this idea that we're constantly adapting, we're constantly evolving. And you know, I heard this metaphor the other day about sailing. So I'm not a sailor. I'll be the first to tell you I'm curating this story. But apparently when you're sailing, you could move and steer with your rudder. Now, that's okay. But the second that you use your rudder, you're creating a drag, you're creating a break. And in a lot of ways, when you think about big change in organizations, why do big changes fail? Because in a lot of cases, they fail because you're trying to take, you know, a bigger bite of the apple or the elephant than you actually can. In fact, the best way to sail, the best way to make these adjustments, and the best way for you to make this adjustment to remote work are micro adjustments. And I love this quote from Alfred North Whitehead. He said, the ultimate metaphysical ground is the creative advance into novelty, that we are all creatively advancing into novelty. And this picture, I think, is just kind of a funny representation of that. Now, one more book I want to reference quickly is Reinventing Organizations that did a, a real nice job of looking at the patterns and cycles of both anthropology and sociology and just the human existence, how we've gathered over the last several thousands of years, and then also how that reflected in the, 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 the business environment, whether it was you know, commerce today or mercantilism or just the, the notion of how we've sold goods and services back and forth. And so 
these colors represent you know, different phases. The, the red color are the laggards. This is way back in the day during Attila the Hun's era, where it was a commanding control. It was a very um, mob-like environment. And believe it or not, we've seen organizations that still run that way. And then there are the late majorities who run a little bit more as a brotherhood or a sisterhood. They have this sort of notion you can see here, some of the examples of the military, the Catholic Church, there's still this patriarchy, there's still this top-down hierarchy, but there's still, there's still a little bit more care, if you will, for the majority. Then you've got the early majorities. These are organizations in the last 30 years that have gotten a heads up, the, the GEs of the world, the Coca-Colas, the Procter & Gamble's, the multinational companies that said, okay, if we're going to be what is you know, almost bigger than some countries in some cases, these organizations are so big, how do we do it? How do we structure it? How do we give people the autonomy, the agency, the trust? And then you can see the early adopters and innovators. These are organizations, they're innovators today that have been doing remote work for a decade. You know, if you want to check out GitHub or 37 Signals um, or Morningstar is another really great example of how to do this in manufacturing, not just remote work, but really the future of work. There's another organization called Automatic that I would highly check out because these organizations started, yes, you know, not so long ago, but most of them are at scale. Several of them have more than thousands of employees and they're thinking about work very differently. So for us, you know, in being a student first of business and work, but also wanting to help serve our clients make these transitions, facilitate these big changes, we wanted to map this out for you. So stage one of remote work is what we call remote allowed. Now, Remote allowed would have been a nice way to say before COVID-19, like if there was a really special exception for you needing to remote work, then you can do it. But if there's not a real special exception, you can't. There's, there's, we would default to having you in the office. And at this point, we would put you in the late majority category, like not in your industry, but in the game of business. The second stage of remote work would be the remote for now, that we're just gonna do this until COVID-19 is over. And that might be okay too, but I would urge, I would invite, and I would submit <laughs> that we're all going to have a chance to learn things that we never would have otherwise if we just accept the learnings, if we accept this new reality and help co-create a better reality moving forward. And this is everything from you know, the way that you employ people to the way that you lead people to the way that you work throughout the day, all these things we're gonna talk about today to getting to the stage of being an early adopter, a rockin' remote mentality. So here, we're talking about an organization that is more fluid and flexible, back to the concept of being buoyant, right? You keep your head above water and maybe even to a point where you become more resilient as an organization. So again, the three things that it's gonna take to do this is autonomy of your people, you know, really giving them a chance to think through how they do what they do so that they can have more agency. More agency is really about their decisions that they can make for themselves, therefore producing a lot of trust in your environment. Now, before I click off of this particular slide, you should know one of the biggest and I think best examples of the workplace, certainly not perfect, is Google. You know, they did a study back in July of 2016 of their development teams and about 100 plus teams were studied, very similar to the way that we study high performance. You go out into the field, you see you know, the animal, so to speak, in their natural habitat, so that you can really witness and process engineer like what separates the good from the great? What really um, helps you get to a high performing environment? What are the factors? What are the features? What are the accelerators? And what are the barriers? Well, this big study came back and you'd be really shocked that at a big tech company, one of the biggest tech companies in the world, they have you know, about $2 million per employee pull through, their employee efficiency is through the roof, that they, bumbled, they, they, they boiled it all down to one concept, psychological safety, which in short is trust. It's that their teams don't have to look over their shoulder, that they feel like they're more in a wolf pack mentality where if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And when you think about an organization or even a sports team, you know, I'm sure all of us here have some, you know, connection to a story in sports 
where sometimes it's not about how talented you are, it's about how you potentialize that talent. It's how you make each other better. In a lot of respects, it comes down to trust. So what's the, the, the map for remote work? For us, we wanted to give you five keys today, five basic keys that everyone, regardless of the size of your organization, and regardless of if we're working with you right now, these tools should be really helpful. So we're gonna talk about managing your state, creating the space, setting a strategy for communication, designing the structure of your day, and adjusting the system. So first, managing your state. We could spend two and a half hours here, at least going from this concept of fragile or fragility to anti-fragile. This was of course a famous book, The Black Swan by Nassim Tlaib. Um, I, I would highly encourage you just to check out the philosophy behind this. Not that this is a black swan event because as my partner in Shift Ventures, Jeff Cherry recently penned a great blog on Medium, but this is not something we couldn't have seen. We knew that a pandemic was possible. So we knew that it was possible, but how do we become anti-fragile as both businesses, as people, and, and, and probably more importantly as a society? How do we sure up these vulnerabilities? And so becoming anti-fragile is almost like becoming beyond resilient. But look, who loves adversity? Who loves challenges? Who loves hardship? None of us, not at first. You know, the idea that this adversity is gonna breed clarity of what you're scared of, your aversions, what you're attached to in terms of what expectation you have. You know, it's gonna help uncover your hidden abilities, your hidden relationships, new approaches. And there's some really great books down here. Everything from A Man's Search for Meaning, probably the, 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 the millionth time, of course, exaggerating here, how many times I've recommended this book because it is a really healthy perspective on adversity. Um, Jonathan Haidt, The Happiness Hypothesis, another really great prose on this. And Ryan Holiday just came out with a book called Stillness is the Key, a real good thesis around how do we make really good and better decisions as human beings. Now, there is a way through this without reading those books. You know, we have been blurring the line for the last 19 years talking about, you know, not just your professional life, but also your personal life. And for us, we've kind of bumbled it into this like little quadrant where it's not just about your physical. So for today, if you're not finding a way to exercise, you know, at least 20 to 30 minutes a day, I mean, jumping jacks, push-ups, whatever it takes, now that you are remote, you get a chance to live a little differently. You know, highly encourage you to take lots of vitamin C, D, and some elderberry here to keep your immune system high to fight off this COVID-19. But on the mental side, routines, and we're going to talk a lot about routines here today, your composure, the way that you receive this challenge, this opportunity, the way that you turn this, this lemon moment into lemonades is going to come down to your fundamental well-being. And as the, the positive psychology movement got started in the late 90s by Martin Seligman and many others like Daniel Goleman have you know, helped lead the way with emotional intelligence. And there's been all of this great work done on moral psychology. It all still comes down to the fundamental well-being is within your agency. Now, whether you're a spiritual person or not, meditating right now, being reflective, you know, four, seven, eight breathing, give it a whirl on Google so you can see that, or Wim Hof breathing works really well too. And then emotional practices, like how do you get yourself in a place that you felt like today was going to be your day, that you were going to own that day? Well, for us, gratitude at shift is one of the hallmarks. We call it an attitude of gratitude. On the right side of this, you'll see a picture of my little sister being a big hero. She is a nurse for a local hospital here in Baltimore. Uh, she's third in from the right, and she is, of course, on the front lines of this crisis. And I don't, as her brother, take this lightly. And, you know, one of the things that as I was preparing for this webinar to get ready for is, you know, really thinking about how amazingly grateful I am for her, but also all of the other people on the front line. We are about to give so much into the hands of people you know, who work the grocery stores at Walmart and Whole Foods. We're gonna really need all of our healthcare providers and professionals and first responders. I mean, you talk about trust, you talk about a moment of gratitude. And when you can immediately reframe, that's what they call it, cognitive reframing, the moment, what it does is it, it lifts the veil or the cloud 
and it lets you see more clearly. But you got to do the work. It can't just be a kind of a, a quick exercise. So we've listed some questions here that we use here at Shift. I use personally. You know, what can be great about this? Every time that you're in a moment, it's quickly reflexing to what can be great about this? You know, listing out the 25 things that you're most grateful for. For again, most of our clients who are listening to this, you've heard of us talk about the 25 reasons why exercise. Well, this is a little different. This is list off the things that you're grateful for. I love this next question. What are you getting a chance to learn in this environment? We talk a lot about the idea of getting to versus having to. Maybe you're getting a chance to learn about your team differently. Maybe you've had a moment where you had the opportunity to actually just ask people how they're feeling and how they're doing. You know, another question I love here is what really matters? And I do a lot of this type of journaling in my journal every morning where I ask myself questions, you know, and I, and I sit here and I go, you know, what are the things that are most important to me? What really, really, really matters? And then my favorite thing is to write a letter. Now the letter could be to yourself. It could be, I write kids letters to our kids all the time. I write letters to my dad. Sometimes I give them, sometimes I don't, but what writing and all of these exercises does is it takes you out of this quick loop. They say that we basically think like 30 to 50 times faster than we speak. And so when you actually write, what happens is you slow down the head enough to let the heart begin to engage. And so again, if you want to rock remote work, it's first about managing your state. But I get it. There are some problems as you make this transition. And look, we've seen this firsthand over the last three weeks. Most people are not prepared to work from home. They don't have good workspaces. Most people have less than ideal situations or setups. I know for me, it took me a second to get our setup for myself, my wife who runs a small business. Our kids are being online schooled as we speak. You know, people who aren't maybe as fortunate as we are, are really dealing with a, just a, just a different environment. You know, a lot of companies just basically gave people laptops, but didn't really help them think about the way in which we'd operate moving forward. And so it's been clunky at best, disconnected at worst. And so the next place to go is how to create your space. So you'll see some pictures here on the right of our shift team. A big shout out to them who have been tireless over these last three weeks of being super focused and super caring and helping our clients make this transition. So these are gonna seem like, duh, I, I have to create a space, but you'd be surprised. Sitting at your kitchen table isn't necessarily creating a dedicated workspace. And when you think about the ideal lighting, right? I went out and bought a light just so that people could see my faces as I'm doing lots of web conferencing now, just like you likely are. Keeping your workspace tidy and organized. I gotta tell you, this is something I found a little bit more discipline on since we're now all quarantined, right? The, the idea that I, I wanna like, not have a hot mess sitting so close to, I'm in actually my bedroom right now, right? And so how do I not go to sleep and look at a whole host of work where, you know, they say an organized mind, you know, can be found in an organized desk. And sure you have the proper hardware and software, it seems obvious, but I would again, encourage you to think about what are all the things that your team may need. We'll talk a couple tools today establish some quiet zones for all of the introverts who are listening to this. Really, really, really pay mind to this. You need some alone time. I know for me, if I don't have a good 20 or 30 minutes a day to, to read, you know, uh, to journal, to just take a walk, you know, I become severely depleted. And last, coordinate with the family members. What we've been doing as a family is doing a family meeting every morning. And we're talking about what are the things we've got going that day, we're spending 10 minutes totally focused, no devices, having a real conversation about what is it going to look like to really make some great progress for the day, but also to not drive each other crazy. For me, my space, as I was just talking about, for me, this has been, again, kind of a coming back to where I started. Again, 25 years ago, I started my first business and it looked a lot like this, though not with the fancy light this time. And you know, for me, I've been enjoying this time because over the last three weeks, it's got me back to the essentials. I get a chance to have the, the, the you know, instead of the office was always controlled and kind of kept at a warm er temperature. I love it freezing. I don't know if that resonates with anyone, but I've really like enjoyed the fact that I can keep it at the exact temperature I want. I love the fact that I said this in one of the last webinars and some of the team thought it was weird, but I have not wore 
pants with buttons for a little while and I'm kind of liking it. And, you know, I'm not saying I will never put on dress pants again. And there's not a time and a place for that, but, but really to think about that I get a chance to do this differently. And, you know, whether it's, you know, thinking about the way that I don't have to commute together or, or, or my pets are here, I get a chance to hang out with Buddy and Nala all day and time with the family and just exercise. It's been absolutely fabulous. Number three, communication strategy. So if you're managing your state, you've created the space. The next is, how are you going to talk to people? How are you going to communicate? And we wanted to keep this brief today. There's a lot of different things that we can double click on later. So if you have more questions about one-on-ones, team meetings, and performance reviews, our team has just recreated a whole new way to do this remotely. Um, and we'd be happy to share that with you. <clears throat> but today, I'll keep it a little bit of a higher level because I do think we should start very early back to the beginning, like what is communication? And for me, one of the best definitions I ever heard was this notion that communication is the response you get back. Not what I say, but it's the response. So if it's the response, it means that the onus is on the deliverer, not the message E, right? It's about the messenger. So if that's true, <clears throat> then how do I think about it differently? Well, as a business leader, one of the things that we have been doing at Shifting, and we've been doing this for a while, and I know I've said that, but the running head start has been helpful. Being early to learn you know, what works and what doesn't. Being early to learn and see how you can take a distributed workforce and get us all on the same page. So for our clients, you have probably remember hearing the word beat or system of management or system of engagement. Yes, these systems are about to get a software update because for us, we're thinking from a macro perspective in our organization, what do we want our team to, to feel? What do we want them to think and have each week? If you just zoom out and have that conversation first, I think it's incredibly important. And, and in fact, we think about what's the best way to transition into the week? What's the best way to close into the week? And we've created a whole new map of the way in which we're going to rock each week. I'm going to highlight a few things that you might want to give a shot or a try to in your organization. The first is on Monday, as an entire team, we do an adrenaline call. And it's exactly that. It's, I think it was all a little bit of adrenaline. It starts at 8.30, lasts until nine o'clock. We go all the way around the horn. Everybody has a chance to talk. And we might've asked questions like, what are you most grateful for? Going back to the cognitive reframing tool. We might ask, what are your top three priorities for this week? We might ask and do an exercise of meditation or, you know, just asking people what they're most excited for this week, what their biggest win was last week. What we're trying to do is to create some cadence. You know, I think a lot of, you know, if, if life is art, then I do think music and sports have so much to offer to business and cadence and rhythms and routines and rituals. Rituals are so amazingly powerful when used appropriately. And adrenaline calls, what it does is it gives us all a chance to collect and collaborate. It creates a little bit of space and time for us to have a conversation with each other in a different way that we wouldn't have had otherwise. We then, yes, do leadership meetings. On Tuesday, we block out the day, no team meetings internally, giving everyone a chance to get their work done. I send the team a CEO riff once or twice a week, and on Tuesdays, I try to make it about a teaching moment, right? A quick little five minute riff video around the things that we're seeing as an organization just to give, again, a couple other ideas for folks. And then on Wednesdays, we do our one-on-ones. We send out a big weekly email to the team, especially during the COVID-19 uh, uh, era that we live in, the social distancing, the, the, the idea that we can't see each other as much. We've been over-communicating, not to a point that we want to inundate people because look, there is also a little too much information out there, right? If if, uh, you know, if having the, all of the information at your fingertips made us all instantly smarter than we probably would be in this situation right now, right? So we want to try to be appropriate with the amount of information we give and, you know, really kind of gliding into the Thursday part of the week. If you just think about the cadence of the week, by Thursday, you know, four out of the five days in, it's time to get back to that cognitive reframing. It's time to get back to what we've now donned as a thoughtful Thursday. And so on Thoughtful Thursday, I sent out a quick video again, and I'm highlighting a teammate. I'm highlighting a, 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 a client. I'm highlighting someone who has done something amazing, who needs a bit of appreciation. We have a, a, a line that we say, what you appreciate, appreciates. And so in this context, it's a really amazing exercise. And 
what happens is when I say, okay, so everyone, let's find some appreciation for one of our teammates, um, uh, Misty Aronson, our COO. Then Misty has dozens of notes from everyone that day. It's almost like it's her special day. And this is again, super easy to pull off. We've done virtual socials, town halls, cuss and fuss sessions we've done where we just open up the conversation and give people a chance to say whatever they want without fear of retribution, without judgment, and we just hold space for it. And then we wrap each day, each week rather, with a better you time. And this is probably, we've had articles written about us around this. I think it's one of the reasons we are a best place to work because we wrap the week with this idea that you should spend one hour doing something for yourself. And so before COVID-19, everyone could go read a book, get a massage, go get an exercise at the gym, take a walk, whatever it was. Well, now, because we're now quarantined, we thought it was a good idea to bring us together. So for the last few Fridays, we've done meditation, we've done song, um, gong therapy, we've got breath work upcoming. And so these are just, again, ways to send people back into their home lives better than when they started. And what you'll continue to find the way that you do that is that people will not only feel better, but they will do better. And that's really what it's all about. Now on the micro communication side, quickly, there are dynamics of communication that we've probably all seen before. Words, voice quality, body language, between voice quality and body language, if you add those up, 93% of communication is nonverbal, which is why I'm here today, you know, on this, you know, standing up, acting as if we're in a training setting because, you know, as George Bernard Shaw says, the single greatest illusion is that communication has taken place. So thinking about your words very differently in text messages or, or instant messaging platforms like Teams or Slack, you know, thinking about the way that you send emails now and thinking about, you know, just being very intentional and deliberate. And, and again, we just use a very simple star model here. It's like, why am I going to do this? What am I going to say? When am I going to need it? Who's involved? How's it going to happen? You know, I'm not the very best written word guy, but I do think a lot about communication and how it happens. And I think for us, you know, one of the things that, you know, is also just a good, it's just a good tool to have in your back pocket, which is just always assume positive intent. You know, there was an old adage that said, don't judge behavior as intent. And then this idea of social distancing where we may not be able to read those subtle micro cues from someone's face or their voice. If you just assume best intent, you will have a better day and it will give you a chance that if you go back and forth in an email more than two or three times, the phones still work, pick them up and use them. And so some of the tools that we're using to enhance this communication platform, you know, survey tools like Google Forms, Typeform, SurveyMonkey, um, all the way down to, of course, everyone knows about Zoom and Skype and Hangouts. Online whiteboards, I, I check out Miro and Stormboard. I love MindMass, uh, MindMeister, uh, which is a mind mapping tool. Task management, we love Rike, Asana, and Trello. Uh, Evernote, OneNote, Google, Notion, um, and then engagement tools at the bottom I'd highlight just for a quick second. 15.5 uh, was founded by David Hassel uh, out in California, really amazing human being. He is really trying to revolutionize employee engagement. Um, he and a guy by the name of Daniel Jacobs, uh, who started Avenue, two really interesting engagement platforms. We use um, 15.5 Avenue is something we're exploring at the current moment, but I can see the application and, and really can see the impact that we'll have. So it's important that you have the right tools if you're going to build the right building, if you're going to build the right structure for your team and give some thought to some of these tools here. The last tool I'll quickly share with you, you've probably not seen this one yet. I'm kind of excited about it because it was a idea that our COO had, Misty, a long, long time ago, which was she was like, when you get done a meeting, wouldn't it be cool if you could sort of find a way to see what people thought in the meeting? And so we were like, yeah, that would be great. And she's like, well, what if like at the end of the meeting, we'd send you a quick survey, just, you know, on a scale of one to five, how was the meeting? Well, we sort of sat on that idea. And then lo and behold, this, this, this company, Marlowe, came out with the idea. It's a plug in to Slack. So at the end of all of our meetings now, because it's tied in with Teams, we now get a chance to see, was it good or not? And look, if you don't, you've not studied any about the human bias, we have this, this confirmation bias that runs pretty high, which is we all think we're pretty great. We all think we're the most amazing ever, right? And it's funny when you ask people like, are they a good driver or not? Everybody says yes, even though it does not possibly statistically, can't be true. So for this, you know, one of these conversations that we've been having is how do we, you know, help all of us, just 
you know, get some instant feedback. And Marlowe has been really interesting test for us. So far, so good. I'm really enjoying getting that feedback so I can make, again, those micro adjustments along the way. All right. We're kind of coming into the home stretch here, designing the structure of your day. So this is simple. You'll be able to go through this deck later. Name it. What type of work is it? What are my top three priorities? And how can I better leverage a routine? And with routines, you've seen the slide if you've been working with us at all. Uh, these are my personal routines for the morning and the evening, right? So this is not about work yet, but about how are you going to start your day and land the plane at the end of the day? You'll notice not a lot of technology, not a lot of screen time. If we're really serious about managing your state and creating the space, you're going to need a really good way to process and put protocols in place. Now, you already have routines and habits. You just don't know you have them. And most of us don't really do well with the evening routine because we're just out of gas. We're out of willpower at that point. You know, what I will tell you is falling asleep to the news is not doing anyone any good. You know, you get this nighttime sleep, this, this chance to marinate and, and digest on ideas. Like you should try that, but without falling to sleep watching the news. Like think about, you know, maybe a problem. Think about an opportunity. Think about something that might be really good to wake up to in the morning. And beyond just your morning and your evening routines to which I live religiously by, because it helps maintain my manic state, right? I could easily get revved up the other way. I've been known to do that. And without a little bit of routine, I can, I can fall short. And the days, back to you can see on the left side, left side of this slide, this idea of really being thoughtful about what time you're going to do what. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this here in a second, but Designing your ideal day, it's, you know, make sure that you have daily touch points with the team, practice togetherness, maintain your face-to-face -face meetings. Even if it's, I've done two lunches recently with people on FaceTime, you know, last night we finished a, a virtual happy hour for our members in Shift Society. Don't be distant. There's a time and a place to, to or I shouldn't say, there's a way and, a, and a, uh, where there's a will, there's a way to really bring everyone together. Develop a routine. We've talked about this. Start and end your day with rituals and be prepared for meetings. Now, last but not least, if you're able to manage your state, create the space, really think about communication differently, and then design the structure of your day, the only thing you need at this point is how do you keep the wheels on the bus? How do you keep the train on the track? Grab your favorite analogy, but for me, 25 years ago, when I was first starting my business career, I was at Hopkins. I was a football player. I was woefully not prepared academically. I was a bartender. I moved furniture. I had study hall. And then I started a contracting business in the middle of all of this. And, you know, to keep all of these things straight, including taking care of my mother in the hospital, I needed to create a system. And so I studied Norman Vincent Peale and Dale Carnegie and Les Brown and Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins and all these guys who had come up with ways to prioritize their time. Now, before you, I lose you at this point in the presentation, in the training. I will tell you that every time we survey an organization, they all think they're good at managing their time until they're not. So simple, ask yourself, what are your top three priorities right now? What are they? And do you know the top three priorities for your team this week? Each person. And then if you were to like audit the team, like how much time do they spend on those priorities? The question is, does it add up? Does it add up to the same level that you think it should. So recently, a couple years ago, we did a, a big survey for an organization. We took the executive team out uh, demographically so we could see where they were. We asked them what their top three priorities were and like 30% of them knew what they were, which is a little crazy. And then when we asked them how much time did they spend on their top three priorities, if only 30% knew what their top three priorities are, we had about 25% only spend their week on their top priorities. And we hear this from business executives all the time. They're in meetings all day long, or they can't find time to do the work. Well, then it's time to adjust the system. And so for us, it all starts with this exercise called the hour of power. There are four or five basic steps I'm gonna step you through here. I told you this is an oldie but a goodie. We have been imploring people to do this. I personally can't live without it. Our team does this on Thursdays, Fridays, some do it on Sundays. You know, I, I light a candle, I, I make it a ceremony. Because when I think about it, just speaking to you as a fellow human being, I mean, time is a bit of a precious gift. I think all of us have been woken up to that recently. And 
where you spend your time. It should be where your heart is. It should be where your head is. It should not be what others are telling you to do. And so for me, the first step here is just to, to, to create a little bit of space once a week where you take some time to, to bring them all of the things that you didn't get to this week, all of the things that you have to do to follow up the next week, all the things you have coming up, all the things you have to do to prepare for the next month and, and really start to think about, are these the things that are lighting me up? Are these the things that I was put on this planet to do? Did those meetings go as well as I wanted them to go? I mean, recently I did a, a live training webinar and it didn't go so well, so I re am redoing it because I know I can. I know I can get it to be better. Step two is how do you chunk down this laundry list of things into the hats that maybe you wear? So this is my, you know, from 20 years ago, this is an actual slide. Um, of what I was thinking about is just a, a, a young entrepreneur in this game. Well, today I think about chunking it down into hats, like my dad hat, my husband hat, my Joe hat, my CEO hat, my venture capital hat, my consultant hat, my trainer hat, my author hat, my podcast hat, my thinker hat. I've got a few hats and I want to think about all of those hats differently. I want to think about the activity in those hats. I want to set smart goals, which Again, if you're a shift client, you should know this. And if not, you've been living under a rock for a bit. And if you don't know us, it doesn't matter because everyone's heard SMART goals at some point. This notion of setting specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based pieces. If you plan to fail, you're planning to fail. Mr. Benjamin Franklin said it best. And then finally, you've got to schedule it. Now, when I say schedule these things in, you also get a chance to kill things. Right, if you're familiar with uh, Marie Kondo, wrote a book called The Secret Art of Tidying Up. She's got this very, uh, well, she might have a bit of an OCD uh, tendency, but it's this concept of how do you organize your closet and organize your house and organize your life so that, again, you're centered and grounded. Well, I'd say the same thing with your schedule. It's like, do you have the time into your schedule to prepare and plan? Have you actually scheduled time to plan and prepare? If you have not scheduled time to plan and prepare, you likely won't do it. And so living by your calendar in this way, whether it's journaling and meditating, as you can see every day that I start with and working out, taking the kids to school. Again, this is an old frame. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And finally, you know, give yourself a bit of a grade. Like how are you doing with your family, your friends, your finances, or in this frame, your body, your balance, your being in business. Like remember, you get a chance to be a mirror for yourself. And Again, for folks who just would brush past this exercise, I'd say, are you really potentialized? Are you really the highest performing you could be? And if not, get obsessive about how could you be? Now, of course, give yourself grace in this moment. You know, we should be a little tolerant of things are a little crunchy. They're not quite as smooth as they used to be. But for now, at least giving your chances a sense to go, how am I doing in these areas? And how can I do a little bit better? It is those micro adjustments along the way. The folks that I know who do this exercise, they get what they want, when they want. They don't have it all, they're not perfect, but they sure give themselves a chance differently than most to be deliberate with their time. And look, for me, that time to spend with my family has been amazing over the last three weeks. To reconnect with friends, I've, I've spent the last part of each day, picking up the phone and calling a friend that I haven't talked to in a while. And, you know, again, in the spirit of just talking with you as a human being, a fellow uh, a crew member of Spaceship Earth, as we're traveling into the universe here together, it's like we probably could spend a little bit more time on the heart and not as much time in the head. We've had some amazing uh, family moments. We do uh, dance parties on Wednesday nights now with all these families you can see on the right side that's us doing a little TikTok dance. And again, there's a way to find beauty here and to just love being a student again. So look, change is inevitable, progress is not. We say this because change is gonna to continue to happen. And as we are now thrusted into this new world order, this new future of work is here, we get a chance to collaborate and to co-create it together. So for us, we first wanna say, Thank you again for being here. Thank you for taking your, your lives, your careers, your professions seriously. Thank you for helping us be better. Um, we are, again, humbled and honored and privileged to play the role that we do with our clients and the community. It is, you know, one of the biggest highlights of my life is the work that we do for this world and for hopefully you. And so what's next? 
We've got an amazing document leading through a pandemic where we have put together tools and templates, dozens of them, uh, to help you with remote work, best practices, what's a good system of management, how do I deal with disruption, what are good communication tools and templates. As it relates to the hour of power, that we have a 45 minute webinar just on that, and I would recommend that. And then one last little plug here for Inevitable Future of Work. We've had a podcast now. Um, we've done some really amazing interviews. And most recently with people who are on the cutting edge of the future of work and are helping to give us even great maps and methods for how we think about this work. So I will end the way I started with was another big thank you for being here today, for, for taking the time out of your day to be part of our community and for helping us help you. So the question at the end of the day, at the end of all of our workshops, at least for the next few weeks, is going to be how can we be of more service and support to you? How can we help you think about what you're doing differently? We're here to be of service and support. There are no strings. There are no lead captures at this point. We really just want to be here for the community. It's like when all the world is falling apart from a financial perspective and we're going to all get through this, there's going to be this beauty in the way that we recover because we're just going to create something better than what we had been doing. And we know that this is a time to double down on each other. This is a time to double down on humanity. This is a time to have each other's backs and to expand each other's circle of concern. And you are part of our concern. So thank you again for being here. We will look forward to a upcoming training webinar with you soon. And uh, we wish you well, peace and love.